remember last week <clears throat> we left off with uh, the seventh seal judgment being opened and there was silence in heaven remember that as everybody waited for the next catastrophe to be delivered and just as the world is recovering from the first seven seal judgment these next judgments they're on the way with with no interruptions so I'm thinking that the, the people on earth must be in continual shock wondering if this is ever going to end but we know it's not going to it's only going to get worse and the first four trumpet judgments uh, all have to do with the earth uh, they they really don't have anything to do with the world's political system or the social system or the economic problems that's not what what's happening with these first four trumpet judgments the first four trumpet judgments uh, uh, are, are going to be God's direct assault on what man has turned into an idol because we've turned the world into an idol today just listen to the news as we have Earth Day every year and and you'll get an understanding of where man's heading and uh, man has made his God has made his God out of the love of trees and wells while he's rejected the true God of the universe and since man has made the earth his idol uh, God in turn in the Great Tribulation is is going to bring his steady judgments against that particular idol to destroy it so after the next four trumpet judgments I do believe that the celebration of Earth Day is going to be one of sorrow loss destruction and and mourning over what God has destroyed and the first trumpet judgment is going to enter in hell fire and blood from heaven verse 7 Revelation 8 the first trumpet sounded and there came hell fire mixed with blood and they were thrown to the earth so we we aren't told what caused the hell and the fire and the blood to, to fall on the earth uh, but it could have been a, a, as a result of the tectonic activity in the earthquake that uh, was in verse 5 uh, which probably brought lots of volcanic activity around the world and explosions uh, that, that could possibly raining down uh, dr. Henry Morris who's one of the professors at the Creation Research Institute uh, wrote on on this verse and he suggests that the, the blood may be actual blood or John may be using descriptive language he says the masses of water vapor blown skyward uh, in, in those tectonic explosions might well condense in the intense updrafts as hailstones and the blood of entrapped men and animals might be mingled with them or possibly showers of liquid water drops might be so contaminated with dust and gases as to appear blood red you know however you look at it you guys it's going to be a global catastrophe uh, and verse 7 goes on he says a third of the earth was burned up because of this you really don't know how significant that is Th this is an incredible landmass that we're talking about you have to realize that the landmass of the earth itself is hundred and ninety six million square miles and one-third of that is 65 million square miles that's what was burned up so to give you a sense of how big this destruction through fire would be if you added up the square miles of Canada America Mexico South America Africa and Russia you'd come up with 33 million square miles it's about half of what we're talking about here so you understand that this is so catastrophic there's never been anything like this that has happened since the world began uh, it's 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 unbelievable you know the firestorms that would happen from this kind of event would would, would be global in effect 
and it would change the entire weather patterns of the whole earth. Uh, verse 7 goes on to, to complete the identity of this destruction. He says, a third of the trees were burned up. And all the green grass in the entire world. This is a global firestorm. For all the grass of the entire world to be burned up. Uh, for those that worship trees on Earth Day, this is going to be devastating. And You know, there's some commentators that have had uh, a problem with all the grass burning up here in this section uh, around the world. Because later on... <clears throat> In, in revelations as the tribulation goes on uh, more grass is burned up but you got to realize uh, as you guys have watched california burn up over the years you know that it, it, it can only take about six months to have new grass growing again after a burn happens you see that up on the Raz, uh, santa rosa plateau as they have uh, burns that they do on purpose to to keep the grass from uh, overgrowing and becoming a fire hazard so that, that, take care, that takes care of that. But I don't think we can imagine this kind of a firestorm. Uh, the worst thing that, that, that we've seen is the California fires this year. And uh, Arnie, I, I was wondering if you could just show a, a video of that. And, and I want to think about all the continents that are on fire. This is one little section of California. Can I get an amen? Remember all the continents that I listed? This is like outrageous. Oh my God. People are going to be in shock and awe of, of what God is doing. Because we are going to see whole continents on fire. I think that's good, Ernie. Thank you. You know, it's, it's interesting because I feel like the California fires this year, which were the worst in California history, what was, was like a type of what's to come. Uh, Wednesday evening, we have been studying the book of Hebrews, and uh, last Wednesday night we studied this character named Melchizedek in the Old Testament, who is a type of Christ. Uh, he, he's like a picture of what's to come in the future uh, because he was priest and king and of course we know that Jesus is coming as the ultimate high priest and ultimate king and I feel like the California fires this year were a type of what's coming in the Great Tribulation it's like a wake-up call and uh, it's, it's my prayer that we take God's wake-up calls serious so we need to remember that this is the judgment, and it's, it's an assault on the earth that man has made an idol. So the first trumpet blew, and hail and fire and blood rained down from heaven in a firestorm and, and burn up a third of the earth. The second trumpet blew, and <clears throat> a burning asteroid was sent to land in the sea. So as the general population of the earth is still trying to recover from the firefalls that came from heaven and the most outrageous firestorm that's ever hit earth, John looks and, and here comes something just as bad or worse coming from heaven too. Uh, verse 8, it says, The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown uh, into the sea. So a, a great mountain on fire is a perfect description of an asteroid coming to Earth. It's what an asteroid is, just a big rock, or what John is calling a big mountain uh, on, on fire. So <clears throat> to all the doomsdayers that have been uh, predicting uh, a global catastrophe from an asteroid, uh, they're going to get their wish. Um, you know, as this happens... We, you, 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 can, you can just know uh, that there's going to be speculation on Earth uh, when they begin to see this asteroid of whether it's really going to hit the Earth or not. Uh, people are going to, you know, be able to see this on TV as it's millions of miles away. But what people don't know is, I, I believe from the description here, that God has assigned an angel to this particular asteroid to guide it. To the earth 
into the exact place where God wants it. And uh, it's going to be in the ocean. So as the world leaders argue whether this is going to hit earth or not, uh, the angel is going to be directing its position to hit right in one of our oceans. And I, I wanted to show you a picture of uh, an asteroid that's, that's hitting the ocean. I really prayed about this. And, you know, I asked God, I just said, Lord, do you think I'm exploiting this? And uh, I just realized, no, I'm not exploiting this. What I want to do is make this real to us this morning. And this particular of this, this particular asteroid lands in the ocean. And, and I think it gives us a sense of reality of what's coming. So Arnie, if we could have that one. Gives you a sense of reality, I believe. Uh, so far, the judgments have been on land, the fires, the earthquakes, the volcanoes. Uh, but God has given an angel uh, this particular assignment of destroying the ocean, which is another one of man's idols. Now, there's three supernatural effects that come from this asteroid hit in the ocean. First, it says, a third of the sea became blood. Again, you know, we don't know whether John is talking about literal blood here from the loss of people and sea creatures, or whether he's describing uh, a, a red-looking sea from the explosion that is going to take place. Uh, but <clears throat> this direct hit from the asteroid is is going to be far worse than an atomic bomb going off in the ocean. This is going to be massive. It's going to be global. Um, and <clears throat> once this thing lands, the explosion itself is going to kill off a third of all oceanic life. Verse 9 says, And a third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And finally, the, ra the last result of this explosion is going to be a loss of one-third of all the ships on Earth. This is, this is really interesting. Uh, now, this is going to happen not only from the explosion out there at sea when this thing lands, but it, it's going to take place as the tsunami hits ports in, in all direction. Now, we saw, you know, the last flick was uh, a tsunami uh, in New York, and not to be outdone, uh, I want to show one that's going to happen in San Francisco. You know, the whole place is slipping away, right?
Thanks, Arnie. You know, I, I hope that helps you. Because I know what happens when we, we read these things and we go, uh-huh. But when we see these things, we just back off a little bit and just go, oh my gosh. The reality that is coming to this earth is, uh, is literally, I think, going to, uh, to be a terror. So we need to remember that uh, what's going on here is this is a judgment and an assault on the earth that man has turned into an idol. And it starts off with the first trumpet with hell, fire, and blood from heaven. And a third of the entire global landmass is burned up. Then an asteroid, a burning asteroid, falls in the ocean and a third of all the sea life is destroyed and a third of all the ships and all the ports are destroyed. And number three, the third trumpet uh, is apparently the, uh, a comet that makes landfall. Uh, verse 10, it says, The third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and a third of the springs of waters. <clears throat> so some commentators uh, say that this could be uh, an asteroid or a comet, but I believe that John's description here of this object, uh, he said, is like a torch, and I believe that that's more likely. To, to be a comet, especially with the results that, that happen on the land. Um, the, the tail of a comet would look perfectly like a torch, and with its description, description of covering one-third of the earth, uh, it, it almost has to be a comet. And verse 11 goes on, and it begins to tell us a little more about this comet. It says, the name of the star. Now, John calls everything that are coming in the heavens stars. He says the name of this star is called Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. Again, uh, just like the firestorm that hit the earth, this is another death blow. This time, uh, a third of the earth's fresh water supply is being poisoned. And uh, the name of this comet is going to be Wormwood, a poison that's talked about in the Old Testament. So it's interesting that they named it that. Uh, there's a guy, uh, he's uh, Professor Edwin Booth of the Department of Chemistry at the University of California. And he spoke recently on Halley's Comet. And we know more about Halley's Comet than any other comet that's been by this place. And uh, I, I just found this absolutely intriguing because what he says scientifically just matches up to our passage here. It, it dovetails perfectly. He says, if the astronomers are right in their estimations uh, about the amount of uh, cyanogen gas in the tail of Halley's Comet, and we're just taking Halley's Comet as an example, okay? So he says... Uh, if their estimations of the amount of cyanogen gas in the tail of Halley's Comet, and if that body's vapors do envelop the Earth, we may have a chance to feel the sensations of bugs and insects which are killed by the use of this deadly gas as an exterminator. You know, when they cover your house and do that, that's what they're using, cyanogen. That's what Halley's Comet is full of. And he says, such is the cheerful opinion expressed yesterday by Professor Edwin Booth of the Department of Chemistry of the University of California and a well-known expert on spectrum analysis. He says, we'll all be snuffed out uh, if a sufficient quantity of this cyanogen gas unites with the hydrogen of this planet's atmosphere. Their union, he continued, would form the deadly gas known as hydrocyanic acid, the most deadly poison known to science, uh, which means death for all animals. Uh, I, I found it interesting that he was concerned about the animals and not so much the humans. Isn't that, isn't that just like classic? 
Uh, he's from California, what do you expect? You know? <laughs> so the difference between an asteroid and a comet is asteroids are, are just basically a big rock. Uh, while comets are made up of small pieces of rock, uh, vapors, and ice crystals. So <clears throat> Halley's nucleus as a comet is uh, 10 miles long and 5 miles wide. And the tail of, of Halley's Comet is spread over a million miles in space. Isn't that a mind blower? A million miles? Is th that's a lot of poisonous gas. Um, so as you can see, uh, this, this is not so much a problem of an explosion like an asteroid would be, as we're seeing the results that John tells us about here. This is more of a problem of poisonous gases being spread over a third of uh, uh, dry land. Millions of people uh, are going to die from poisoning of a third of the Earth's water supply, fresh water supply. So we need to remember that this judgment is an assault on the Earth, uh, which man has turned into an idol. The first trumpet sounded and we had hail, fire, and blood fall from heaven and a third of the earth was burned up. The second trumpet sounded and a burning asteroid landed in the sea and a third of the ocean was uh, turned to blood. Uh, a third of all the ships were taken out. Uh, an apparent comet falls on land and a third of the land mass has poisoned water. Y y you know, from what's going on in the past judgments, and these judgments here, don't know if you noticed it or not, but everything is incremented in thirds. And there's going to be some number people here <laughs> that are all about numbers. And, and, and they're just going to wake up one day and just go, oh my gosh, I think this is calculated. A third this, a third that, a third this, a third that. Are you kidding me? This is metered out in thirds, the entire thing. This is coming from God. Wow. I think there may be some people coming to Jesus Christ during the tribulation just because it's all coming in thirds. And you know what that tells me? It tells me that God's still a God of grace, even in the middle of all this judgment. And finally, the fourth trumpet sounds and, and darkness covers the land. So the first three trumpet judgments they all came from heaven. First, the fire, the hail, and the blood. Second, an asteroid coming from heaven. Third, uh, a, a comet coming from heaven. And I, I think that people are literally going to be in fear for their lives <clears throat> just looking up to see what's coming next. Because it's all been coming from the sky uh, with these trumpet judgments. And as the fourth angel sounds his trumpet, their fears are going to be realized. It's from heaven. Verse 12, it says, The fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun, and a third of the moon. Are you noticing the third still? A third of the sun, a third of the moon, a third of the stars were struck, so that a third of them would be darkened, and the day would not shine for a third of it. Wow! And, and the night in the same way. So, now, we, we know that the moon's light is just a reflection off the sun, right? So that makes sense, a third and a third each. Uh, so they're darkened accordingly. But, you know, something's going on supernatural here uh, because it also says a third of the light of the stars is going to be darkened. I, I'm not sure that we can really explain that scientifically. It's the hand of God at this point with no explanation except he's supernatural. You know, normally the sun uh, sets at 5.30 or so, uh, maybe 4.35 these days. Well, uh, and, 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 and that day, uh, the sun's probably going to set at about 12. So w with shorter days like this, there's going to be an instant cooling effect going on on Earth. And from everything that's happened in the seven seal judgments, it's very apparent. It, it sounds like there's been nuclear war along with all the other catastrophes that are happening. And they, they, they might even be going into a short-term uh, nuclear 
winter here, especially as the, 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 the sun is blocked. It's interesting because this judgment is parallel uh, to the ninth plague that happened to Egypt in the book of Exodus uh, that lasted for three days. Uh, the difference is the Egyptians were completely in the dark. Uh, as, as you read that passage in Exodus, it says that it was so dark that there was a heaviness and that you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. That, that's scary darkness there. Uh, with this plague, the sun, its energy, and its light is going to be depleted by one-third. And, you know, since we don't have any scientific explanation of, you know, what's going to make this happen, uh, we got to understand that what's going on here is supernatural. Now, some of us may have a hard time believing in the supernatural, but I'll tell you this much, people in the tribulation, they're not. They're going to see one supernatural event after the other, man. You know, just in, in lockstep. Uh, they're going to know it's literally the hand of God pressing down on man. So the best way to get our explanation of this darkness is to go to the Word of God just to see how it's played out. Now, I, I want to read some verses on the day of the Lord, which Old Testament prophets prophesied over 3,000 years ago about the great day of the Lord that we're talking about right here in the Great Tribulation. Isaiah 13 is an example. He says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel, with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. Well, we'd have to say an amen after the first three trumpet judgments. And he'll destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon uh, will cause its uh, will, the moon will not cause its light to shine. So, because man has decided to live in spiritual darkness, God is going to put him in physical darkness as well and match the two up. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 32 prophesies, and he says, "When I <clears throat> put out your light." I'll cover the heavens and make its stars dark. I'll cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of the heavens I'll make dark over you and bring darkness upon your land, says the Lord God. In Joel chapter 2, another prophet from the Old Testament, he says, The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, <coughs> And the stars diminish their brightness. Isn't this interesting? All this Old Testament prophecy from 3,000 years ago is lining up with the book of Revelation. Um, Joel uh, 2.31, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And Amos uh, chapter 8 says, And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord God that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. It's going to scare the kajibis out of everybody. After everything that's happened, all of a sudden for the sun to go down at noon, you're going to think this is the end. Can I get an amen from anybody? Look, if you were there, you'd say amen. I'll tell you that much, man. Uh, this is all about the fear of the Lord. Even Jesus talks about the same thing in the New Testament. In Mark 13, Jesus says, But in those days after the tribulation, and for anybody that didn't make it here the last two weeks, we defined uh, what the tribulation as opposed to the great tribulation is. The tribulation is the first three and a half years of judgment. The great tribulation is the last three and a half years of judgments, just so we have our definitions right. So as Jesus speaks and he says, but in those days after the tribulation, in other words, after the three and a half years, for the next three and a half years, when all hell's breaking loose, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Even Jesus himself gets, on the, gets in on the picture here. In Luke chapter 21, he says, there will be signs, this is Jesus speaking again, uh, there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. 
What a description of the tsunamis that we just read about. What a description of darkness and what a description of terror. Uh, this darkness is no doubt going to send uh, a sense of fear and depression over the entire world. Did you know darkness does that? Do, do you guys know out of all the states in the United States who has the greatest problem of depression? It's Alaska. It's Alaska. It's horrible. The suicidal rate is higher in Alaska by far. They, they, they go through months and, and months of, of darkness. Everybody's going to be fearing for their lives during this time. Uh, and, and, and hope is going to be vanishing with every day that follows. No one could have thought that all these things were going to happen to them. Everybody's going to be in shock. And, and everyone is going to be waiting for the next shoe to drop. So we just need to remember, you know, what, what is God doing here? He's bringing an assault on the earth itself. The earth that people have tried to make into their God. And he's, he's done it with the first four trumpet judgments. The first trumpet being a firestorm falling from heaven itself, taking out a third of the world. A burning asteroid that uh, takes out a third of the living life in the ocean and takes out a third of the ships through tsunamis. An apparent comet that falls on land and, and poisons, poisons continents uh, in, in their fresh water. So people are dying from that. And, and then finally, the, the darkness that is going to cover the land. So th this is where we come to the end of our service. And we, we just want to ask the Lord, God, what are you trying to say to me? You know, we, we don't like just to study these portions of Scripture and then leave. It, we we, we got to figure out what God's trying to speak to us this morning. Uh, you know, maybe there's some people here today that could be in, in spiritual darkness. Uh, you know, and maybe you're here this morning and, and you just finally got a glimpse of the reality that, that is coming here to earth. And, and maybe you have some fear in your heart over the things that we're looking at this morning. If, if, if that's what you're sensing this morning, all I can tell you is it's a blessing from God. How, how could I say that fear in your heart could be a blessing from God? Because fear of the Lord is a gift. Do you realize that most of the people that hear the words from this section of Revelations don't believe it? Because their hearts have been so hardened. The same thing is happening today that happened to Israel in the Old Testament. As I was thinking about this passage this week, I, I, I thought about uh, the various prophets uh, that came to Israel and warned Israel what was coming shortly when they were going to be wiped out by the Chaldeans and taken away as slaves. And you know what they did? They tried to kill the messenger. And they brought in their false prophets. Many of those good Israeli prophets had to fight false prophets. Sometimes they'd bring in 50 false prophets to tickle the king's ear. Because the king didn't want to hear the bad news. And, and, and at times, when, when the king did hear the bad news, they, they, he threatened to put the prophet to death. And so the prophet had a decision to make. Am I going to deliver God's message? Or am I going to cave in to the king? Well, it's really not that much difference today. And I'm so sad to say, there, there's many churches that refuse to teach these passages because of fear of scaring people. What a tragedy that is. When God put a warning in his word to save, save us, and to keep us from going into these tragedies, this is the most important message we could have today. 
And I believe it's the most important message that you can take out of here today. Now, somebody came to me last week and asked if we could uh, begin to have some DVDs or CDs of a series of these messages. And, and we're going to do that. I talked to Arnie this week. But, I, you know, as, as somebody asked me about doing that, I kind of walked away and thought about it for a bit. And I just thought, what an awesome evangelistic tool. If you're talking to somebody and you end up talking about the end times and just say, hey, wait, I got a CD in my car on this very thing we're talking about. Can I give you one? Wow, that's powerful. So what, what is God trying to speak to us? You know, for, for everyone that's here today and you know God's speaking to you, 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 you can sense that fear that there is something that's not right between you and Jesus Christ. I tell you what, the Lord brought us here today. And I, I promise you, I'm going to give you an opportunity to surrender your life to Christ. To come to God in no, un, no uncertain terms, holding nothing back, just being able to give yourself to Christ and understand that you're, you're not only saved, or if you're, if, if you're not a Christian, you're going to be saved. And, and God is going to have his hand of protection on you.